Firstly now, why is it important to talk about veterinary surgery at a spine conference for humans? Uh, well, uh, it would be great if it was a spine conference for humans and animals, but uh, as uh, it is a spine conference for humans, it's just great to be here as a token vet. There isn't enough uh, interaction between the two disciplines because remarkable advances could be made if we listen to each other more. It's very important, I think, for folks like me uh, who specialize to a very large extent in spinal surgery and orthopedics, as I do, uh, to be here and to listen to what the guys, what, what our colleagues in the human surgical arena have to say and also to look at their implant technology and the thing that we must not forget is that nearly all that implant technology has come from an experimental animal model. So the vast majority of spinal fusion cages, spinal stabilization systems, spinal disc replacement have had to be tested in animals in order to give them to humans. So what I like to do uh, uh, is to make people think, well maybe there are other ways that we can explore collaborative efforts for the betterment of the animal as well. And obviously my job as a veterinary surgeon is to be the advocate for the animal. Uh, so my job every day is fixing dogs and to some extent cats as well, but mainly dogs that have uh, major spinal problems. And the implants we use, the, my lecture was on uh, implants for stabilization or for disc replacement. But those implants are remarkably similar to what you use in the human field. And to a very large extent, what I would like to see, and the reason I'm here, and the reason that Bronick invited me, and he did, he's done a great job at trying to integrate all those human uh, disciplines in spinal surgery together under one platform. But what we'd both really like to see is greater collaborative effort between veterinary surgeons in speciality fields and human surgeons in speciality fields because we have both got so much to learn from each other all of the time. Absolutely. Uh, one of the surgeries that's particularly relevant that you've been pioneering is disc replacement in animals. I wondered how did you plan for your very first case? Um, that's a great question because when you look back in the literature, nearly all implants that we want to use in clinical veterinary animals affected by disease have already been used in an experimental animal to help a human. So the first point that we would look at in evolution of any implant system is how many animals have had an experiment and then died to give them to humans. And go from that point and say, well, can I help an animal to live again with that same implant system? And I think, uh, so for me, developing a disc replacement system will look at what's best in the human field derived from animal experiments and give it to an animal that really needs it and try and get the best of the experience that's been learned in the animals who gave their lives and the humans who have been treated successfully with that implant system and give that back, it's a fair deal, to an animal that really needs that technology. I mean, that, that's my life's purpose. That's why the Human Animal Trust, the charity that founded is here. We realize that you need safe drugs and implants for humans, we get that but we believe that there is a better way uh, of collaborative uh, cross-research. Um, we only fund projects where it benefits the animal as well as the human. So it doesn't involve the sacrifice of the animal for the benefit of the human. And I go so far as to say, we talk about advances in technology. We have the technology now to image implants in real life inside the animal. There's no longer any need to sacrifice the animal's life to get your information. And therefore, in 2017 and moving forwards, I'd like to see a whole new vista whereby we give an animal that has the disease the solution to that disease. And as we do so, we learn together that helps many more humans and many more animals in the future. So it seems like there's a lot of exciting research to be done uh, between both humans and animals to make sure that we are collaborative in our approaches in the future. Do you have any advice for spinal surgeons and for researchers in the area and how they can get the best out of both animals and humans? Uh, first thing is uh, don't ignore uh, what's happening in clinical veterinary practice. Hilariously and ironically and sadly uh, when I arrived the first question was how much does that cost? Do you really do that on animals? Why don't you just put them to sleep? Uh, our narrow insular worlds that we live in, whether you're a veterinary surgeon living in, in my silo or you're a human surgeon living in their silo, it's a busy world. You know, we have busy jobs. So to look outside of that is not our job remit for most people. And I try and really hard to 
think differently about things. Why would I not walk through the exhibition and see what's available? Why would I try and reinvent the wheel? The same would be true of human surgeons and researchers. Don't ignore the wheel we're already inventing in real life clinical practice. There's no need to kill another hundred dogs to know what I already know. Just come and ask me what I already know and where do we take it from there to get the best for your patients at the same time. And I guarantee you that society will demand that in the next 10 to 20 years because society does not want to have safe drugs and implants at the expense of the animal kingdom. What they'd rather is a joined up effort whereby we all move forward together. And that really is possible. It may not have been possible before, but we now have the technology, we have the, the will to do it, and we need a framework for collaboration to move things forward. Finally, I wanted to ask about your center. It's a state-of-the-art facility, and I hear it's undergoing some upgrades. Yeah. I wondered if you could uh, discuss a little bit the kind of things you've been doing to the facility. Well, that's um, a very pertinent question in the light of what you just asked me about the human medical field. Right now, in human medicine, there's a lot of things you can't do. For example, you can't currently, in the United Kingdom at least, do a stem cell augmented uh, spinal replacement system because it's not yet uh, MHRA approved uh, for use in a human. But if we have a situation where an animal desperately needs a piece of tumor replacing or desperately needs a reconstruction done that can be very difficult to achieve uh, with just man-made material, we're building a new center uh, which can marry the very best of biomechanics with cell biology. So to try and get the very best from uh, human-made material and the very best from nature-made material to uh, augment the repair for the betterment of the patient. The new center is called FIRST. It's lucky I'm called Fitzpatrick. So that stands for the Fitzpatrick Institute for the Restoration of Skeletal Tissue. Happens to be the first time in the world at the clinical call phase where we're gonna try and get the perfect marriage of, of biology and mechanics. But it's a real step forward. And I, I'm built in the operating theater I'm building, uh, there's a viewing panel so that we can bring our human medical colleagues and our veterinary medical colleagues in, learn together, teach together, but most importantly, benefit the patient together. So it seems like you'll get some really important research and some really important results from your work at that facility. Well, remember my work is, is very, very clinical. Mm -hmm. So when we use the term research, we need to be very careful there because everything that I do is an active clinical veterinary practice that's in the interest of that specific animal at that moment in time because the other options are suboptimal. The, the paradigm shift that needs to happen is we need to move away from the arena of experimentation toward the arena of human and animal models collaborating to move science forward because I guarantee you that more than half of that ravine between the unknown and the known can be crossed by collaboration before we even have to think about experimentation. So research in its truest possible sense should be at the clinical call phase, but yet it's been separated into researchers and clinicians. Not, not so, it shouldn't be that way. The clinicians should be at the forefront of modeling of disease and learning from real life clinical cold face disease so that the research can be brought into the environment in which the patient exists. And when we do that, everybody wins.